The grain markets were on the defensive again today with bean oil futures leading losses in the soy complex, which weighed on corn prices, which failed to generate much buying interest in wheat futures. Feeder cattle futures found the buying again today to trade even higher with live cattle lower. Lean hogs inched to the upside. Live from a game of inches via Farm Journal broadcast, this is AgriTalk. This afternoon, it's a conversation with Craig Van Dyke from Keystone Cooperative. I'm handsome newsman Davis Michelson, and now the host of AgriTalk, Chip Laurie. All right, Davis. Hey, thank you so much. Welcome to AgriTalk. Glad that you're with us on this Thursday afternoon. Here we are. Thursday afternoon already. You know, that means tomorrow is Friday. Yeah, it sure does. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I had, too. Uh, no. Doesn't <laughs> get you fired up about anything? I mean, you know, it's it, we're heading into the know. weekend, right? I'm fired Isn't up that... about doing this right now, baby. I don't know how much more there fired up go. I can get. Yeah. There you go. We got Craig <laughs> Van Dyke coming in today. Of CBD. course we're fired up. Yeah, baby. CBD. Yep. Looking forward to the conversation with Craig. Um, if you haven't noticed yet, one of the things that I've been trying to do in the afternoon shows, you basically go back to last Friday when we had Clark Neighbors on, is I've been trying to talk about some of the regional differences in the cash markets. And uh, I love getting guests on from the, from the co-ops. And uh, we had Luke Beckman from CVA on earlier this week. Now we've got Craig Van Dyke. On from Keystone, we're going to talk about some of the things that are happening in the cash market over in the eastern Corn Belt there in in northern uh, Indiana. So looking forward to the conversation. It's always a good one. You betcha. Um, You you know, it it hasn't gotten much better weather-wise today, dude. We're still looking at cloudy conditions. The wind is blowing. I had a gust of wind so hard like oh just 10 minutes ago that it was blowing around the table and the chairs up on the deck really yeah are you sure that your deck isn't first... just haunted is it is it haunted maybe that might be it um it, i don't know by who ghosts? i mean yeah. nah, I, that would be that would be something new to me if that was the case okay okay i guess i can't rule it out well wouldn't but that they be didn't cool? mention it they didn't mention it at the weather class that I took at the University of Northern Iowa, so I can only assume that it's not a thing. It's not a I thing? Guess, if you I'm mean going back. table and chair gust winds mm-hmm. weren't like some sort of official designation of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm really I bet surprised there's a name by for that. It. You give them I, a minute really... and they'll make up a name. They'll come up with a That's name right. for that. That's right. It'll be <laughs> deck storm, uh-huh. whatever. Whatever. Uh, it's patio yeah. shear is what it is. Patio shear. <laughs> patio shear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Love it. All right, man. Let's get to the news. Well, Chip, wheat futures traded lower early in the session and slightly extended losses ahead of the final trade. Prices are showing some volatility as traders adjust to new headlines from Russia's war with Ukraine. Wheat export sales in the weekend of November 14 totaled nearly 550,000 metric tons. And that was at the high end of trade expectations. South Korea topped the list of buyers, which also included Mexico, Indonesia, Japan, and unknown destinations. December soft red winter wheat futures opened to state, rallied to spike resistance at yesterday's high, and then dropped back to close near session lows. December HRW wheat futures today, six and one quarter cents lower at 5.55 and a half. December soft red wheat down three and three quarters, 5.48 and three quarters. December spring wheat closed at 588, down four cents on the day, heating up over there in the uh, Russia Ukraine zone, Chip. It is, and the wheat market doesn't seem to want to pay any attention to it. We've talked right. about it, and and more than once this week that uh, the the wheat market is is numb to yeah. news and headlines out of the Black Sea region, even even with some of the most uh, you know boy dangerous headlines that we've mm. seen coming yeah. out of the region in this year uh, and the wheat market still doesn't want to respond yeah 
Well, Chip, export sales of corn in the weekend of November 14 totaled 1.5 million metric tons. That was in line with trade expectations. Mexico topped the list of buyers and accounted for more than half of the sales. Unknown destinations, Japan, Colombia, and Vietnam were also on the list of buyers. There were also reports South Korea is actively buying corn from the U.S. or South America this week. The lack of a crop threat in South America and strength of the U.S. dollar index were a weight on corn prices today. December corn futures traded on both sides of 430 for a third time this week. Today's low-range close has chart watchers targeting Monday's low at 422 and a quarter. December corn futures today, three and one half cents lower, 426 and three quarters. March corn down three and three quarters to 436 and one quarter. July corn futures close at 446 and a half, down three and one half cents. This corn demand is good enough. Um, I, I, I would think that it would would prevent even, you know, kind of a slip in, in prices like we had today. Uh, But this corn market is, people have been talking about it on the show recently. The corn demand is good enough that it could tighten up the balance sheets a little bit more. We'll talk to Craig about that yet here today. Well, we got a Texas-sized chunk of news on the soybeans here. It was a big demand day for the entire complex. USDA reported export sales of 1.86 million metric tons of soybeans in the weekend of November 14, topping trade expectations China was at the top of that list of buyers, accounted for nearly 1.2 million of the bean sales. Mexico, the Netherlands, Germany, and Indonesia were also on the list of buyers. Hmm. USDA this morning also reported the sale of 198,000 metric tons of beans for delivery to China, 135,000 tons of beans to unknown destinations, and the sale of 133,000 metric tons of soybean meal to the Philippines. Despite that strong demand, soybean oil led the price decline and pulled soybeans and bean meal lower. January beans closed on session lows and at the lowest level since August 16. January beans today, 12 and three quarters cents lower, 977 and three quarters. March beans down 14, 985 and one quarter. July beans closed at 10, 11 and one half down 13 and three quarter cents chip. Yeah, December soybean meal down a dollar seventy two eighty seven seventy, and December soybean oil down a hundred and ten points forty two eighteen. Wow. Well, cotton export sales jumped sharply from the four week average and hit three hundred eighteen thousand five hundred running bales. December cotton today seventy three points higher at sixty nine nineteen. On your livestocks, beef export sales in the week hit fourteen thousand three hundred metric tons. And boxed beef prices were higher in early trade, but live cattle futures posted a high range open and a low range close. December fat cattle down 70 cents to 185.60. February futures down 50 cents to 182.42 and one half. And January feeders up $1.12 and one half to 53.45. And finally, on your snout side, pork export sales totaled 14,300 metric tons. Futures still working to narrow that discount to the cash lean hog index. December hogs today, 27 and one half cents higher at 80, 80. February hogs up 17 and a half, 84, 65, buddy. All right. Thank you very much, Davis. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, d- d- just a defensive day all the way around. Now, it, it, that hasn't been unusual in the futures markets, but when this happens, what happens in the cash market? Do we get some movement? Is there some movement in basis that we might expect after something like this. We'll uh, we'll find out from Craig Van Dyke, Keystone Co-op next. I don't know what you're thinking, so call us at eight five five four Talk Ag and tell us what's on your mind. Lazy yellow moon coming up to tonight, shining. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chuck. Glad that you are with us on this uh, Thursday afternoon. We've got a lot of ground to cover with Craig Van Dyke, Keystone Cooperative out of Valparaiso, Indiana. Craig, it is good to talk to you again. How are you? Chip, I'm doing well. Appreciate you having me back on here. Good, good, good. Glad that you're here, man. How'd, this, how'd the fall wrap up for, I shouldn't say wrap up, how'd the fall go for you this year? <laughs> Fall was a completely different world than what we saw last year in the East. Um, and, and 
I'd argue that's probably the case uh, across most of the country, just how fast this harvest moved along. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it seemed like mid September, all of a sudden things got rolling. And honestly, I feel like last week I woke up and was like, Holy smokes, <laughs> we're done. You know, last year, I feel like we were still in the thick of things today and granted where I'm at, we're generally a week or two behind, uh, the curve, but it's kind of nice going to maybe yeah. be actually, uh, be able to enjoy Thanksgiving and Christmas even. So, um, yep. so that, I'm okay with it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When you put that much volume into the system all at one time, what, what, what kind of market impact does that have? Well, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to touch on with what we okay. saw in the East is, you know, the expectations coming into this fall were big crop, right? And and we, I would argue we've had a good corn crop here in the east. Uh, I might argue we've had about an average soybean crop in the east. Um, but the the, you know the the expectation of us getting plugged and things moving too fast, and uh, you know the old crops still moving, getting in the way, just yeah, kind of, you know the fatal funnel, right? Everything coming together at once. And I, I definitely learned some big lessons this year. And the first to just not to underestimate how fast and efficiently we can move the crop if we need to. Um, the rail performed very well, despite lower drafts, we still move stuff on the river. Um, but the, the, Biggest factor in all of that was just how dry this crop was coming in. I, I okay. you know, I uh, talked to everybody here as far as, you know, the old timers, what they've seen. And, you know, we dried very little corn this year. Yeah. Um, and I think that also caught the market off guard a little bit, just how quick we could put it away and still have some space. Uh, because drying wasn't slowing things down, getting things in the way. And I also wonder a little bit here if how dry this corn crop was is maybe we utilized quite a bit more on farm storage, you know, stuff we couldn't use last year because of a wet corn crop. And we were able to put stuff straight into the bin without running through a dryer this year. Right. Um, so there, there was a couple of Big factors, maybe some of them underlooked. Um, I would definitely argue the culmination of everything was was definitely overlooked um, because we've seen the buyer here thinking, oh, you know what? It's shoot last fall basis was in the in the tank. You know this yep. crop's going to come to us. Not a big deal. We're going to wait. We're going to wait. Gonna, we're going to wait. Yeah, and we the east was maybe pluggy for a day, maybe. Really? Yes. Man. And all of a sudden, buyers kind of seem to realize at once, and we'll call it, we'll we'll call this another fatal funnel the other way, saying, "Oh shoot, this crop's yeah. just not going to fall into my lap. I better start getting to work here." Um, so the, the biggest factor here, just the speed and how dry this crop was. Okay. Right. And, 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 and don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll, um, I'll put myself in the category of underestimating those moves. And yeah. I know some of the question here is, well, where is all that old crop then? Right. We've heard yeah. that, you know, where was this all old cool crop at? I was going to say, I wanted to circle uh, back and say, now first, okay, what happened to the old crop? Was it in the way? I can tell you right now in our region, you know, we were getting a lot of old crop in in August and early September, you know, and I had the same questions of, you know, how, how are we going to be able to move all this out of our way and, and still handle the new crop bushels and keep our doors open, right? And, and it was a challenge. Trust me, my guys were we were very exhausted by the beginning of November. Um, but there was a big effort, you know, to move that stuff down the river in August. Um, you know, there, there, there was a big effort to make that push earlier. Um, and we never saw, you know, basis premiums um, at the front end when you might generally see, you know, the old crop pipeline get tight versus the new crop pipeline. We never really saw that. So we did a great job 
uh, moving that old crop out of the way and then handling the new crop as well. Um, So a lot of credit to our logistics and rail efficiencies to make that happen. Yeah. And then um, it sounds like, and I don't know this for a fact, I, it, but it sounds like farmers just kind of rotated those old crop stocks out and the new crop stocks in. I, they didn't hesitate to refill their storage, did they? Yeah, probably a combination of that. I don't know if I have a great gauge as to how much that was and, and right. what we did. But but that's where I throw in the factor here of, you know, being as dry as this corn was coming in, yeah. you know, how much on-farm storage is out there that wasn't used last year or didn't get a chance to that was maybe utilized this year because you were able to put it in a bin without drying it. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, that'd be, an, you know, not sure if we'll ever have that number or know what the difference is, but to me, that's, that's a big line in the sand. So um, as to what determined how well we were able to move through this. And then I, you know, I know you're going to get the other question right after that as well is the crop as big as what they said it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, on the corn side, I would argue in the East, yes, very good corn okay. crop. Um, on the bean side, though, and I think the USDA made some of these adjustments accordingly. I mean, we were taking in beans at 9 10% moisture, right? Yep. You start doing some of that math, well, you know, you figure about a 3% reduction in yield then if your average, you know, bean is 10 11%. Yep. Well, that's a bushel and a half. You yeah. Know? So... Exactly. What did the USDA adjust bean yields in the last report? Oh, 1.4 bushel. And a half. Yeah. So, you know, that that maybe is recognized. How much of that is actual yield? How much of that is moisture? Um, yeah. Still some questions up you, in the air. But, has, that, has that been fully accounted for, the dry, the, the low moisture level in the corn and the soybean crops? Has that been fully accounted for on the <laughs> supply side? I would argue on the supply side for beans, I, I don't quite think the combination of dryness and yield has been accounted for yet, drop in yield. Okay. Um, corn, I, I think, is probably pretty well in line. Um, okay. So, But, you know, back to the speed of this harvest and what we've seen yeah, in the markets, yeah. you know, demand during harvest started ballooning in a big way. Right, right when we needed it. And, you know, the old adage of low prices cure low prices, right? I mean, yeah. we've seen the demand come right when we needed it this year. Um, and still monster demand today. But what did that do to these markets in, in the East? And the flip in basis was fast and huge. You know, last year, corn basis basically, you know, had you're the foot on its throat dang near all year long yep this year that you know seasonal basis pop right happened within about a week i felt like yeah um so you know we went from the heavy unders you know at the point where everyone was starting to think oh you know the blood is in the streets here and just ripped right back around as buyers kind of started to come in and say boy we better start buying this stuff because it's, it's not just going to, just going to come to us that easily this year. So. Right. Okay. um, Okay. I want to talk a little bit more about the buyers here real quick. Um, I asked if the low moisture level has been accounted for on the supply side. Does it also need to be accounted for on the demand side? I'm thinking of feed rations. I'm thinking of, of ethanol conversions. And Craig, I have no idea on this one. It, Boy, that's a complex to... question and a lot of math. And probably by the time I were to do all that math, it would change. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're sure, right? I mean, you, obviously there's factors at play there, right? Um, yeah. You know, it factors in on, on both ends of that equation. As to how much, you know, and how to gauge it, you know, Boy, I haven't thought that hard about it. Um, so right. I don't have any fantastic answer there. But um, yeah, if, it, if it's going to factor in on the supply side, it's definitely factoring in on the demand side. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, messages from the market. Then we got to get to the balance sheets here. Uh, what changes do you expect 
to the November supply and demand balance sheets on corn and soybeans. What are people doing about it? What's it mean for 2025 decisions? And we got to talk a little bit of wheat. Let's go to the markets page at profarmer.com and check today's closes where December HRW wheat futures were six and one quarter cents lower at 555 and a half. December SRW wheat down three and three quarters, 548 and three quarters. December corn futures were three and one half cents lower at 426 and three quarters. March corn down three and three quarters to 436 and a quarter. January soybean futures were 12 and three quarter cents lower at 977 and three quarters. March beans down 14 cents, 985 and a quarter. December cotton today was 73 points higher at 69.19. On your livestock, December fat cattle down 70 cents, 185.60. January feeders up a dollar 12 and a half to 253.45. And December lean hog futures 27 and one half cents higher on the day at 80. 80. Get more. Visit tryprofarmer.com. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. Our name says it all. AgriTalk. What more do you need to know? Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm your host, Chip Flory. We are in the middle of a conversation with today's guest analyst, Craig Van Dyke, uh, Keystone Cooperative out of Valparaiso, Indiana. Okay. Craig, start with start with corn, and step me through what you think might have to change on the balance sheet, supply side, demand side, anything side in that balance sheet uh, compared to what we had from USDA earlier this month. Gotcha. Well, let's hit a few quick topics on the corn side, right? First, okay. U.S. corn continues to be the cheapest origin of corn in the world. Okay. Um, and we are selling corn at a faster pace than we ever have. All right. And I know there's probably some conversation of, is this, you know, the Trump effect, right? Is, is the market trying to buy grain in front of when Trump actually takes office because of concerns on how trade policies go? Right. Um, you look at the fundamentals of this and, and you, you look at global corn stocks, which, you know, currently are down 10 million metric ton versus last year. You know, we have a very large amount of unshipped corn sales on the books as of right now. So they say, well, okay, Trump takes office. Maybe some of that gets canceled. And I said, you're an argue. I say, I, I don't think this whole quote unquote Trump effect really is the reason for this corn demand. The fundamental situation is the reason for this corn demand. Right. I don't see any reason why it gets unshipped. And when you look at, you know, your top global corn exporters and you remove the United States from, you know, the, uh, the global stocks to use sheet here, mm-hmm. the, where else are you going to go, right? The U.S. is, stocks are very tight without the U.S. exporting corn. Um, so for me, I don't see any reason why these unshipped sales that we have on don't get booked. Okay. Okay. They are big in a big way and fast. And fundamentally, there's, you know, the the price is the reason why. And we're a reliable source as well, right? Okay. So On the shipping, uh, real quick, Craig, can we handle this pace? Can we get Can we get it done? Yeah, why why couldn't we? Right. I mean okay, I, I just gave the 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 example of how fast we were able to move stuff yeah. um during yeah. harvest. Good I see point. no reason why not. Uh, barring, you know, the major outliers, but um we're not gonna try to predict that stuff. As of right okay. now, I see no reason why we don't continue to do that for corn. Outstanding. Okay. okay. Yep. Um so when you look at the USDA's balance sheet. You know, I, I think I'm mostly in line with just about everything except for one category. Um, to me, their export number is still too low. Okay. Um, I think you need to add another two to 300 uh, million bushel of corn on that. And 
and to me that puts you know our stocks to use ratio around this 10 and a half to 11 percent area okay? okay um you know we're we're seeing corn spreads narrow up bean spreads narrow up we're seeing the market try to get this stuff moving um so as of today you know these corn futures are mostly in line with delivery values okay um the 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 balance sheet to me that's the only only area i see on corn that that i think the usda is off okay and so if this demand stays like it should and i see no reason for that to change and it should continue to be strong in the you know the next two quarters here um you know i wouldn't necessarily argue the corn market versus december is undervalued today it's now we're in line with delivery values but you know i look a little further out here and, and say you know i think there's opportunity to be more in the 450 to 470 range um for deferred futures but you know, look out here to July at 446, right? So yep. maybe the market has that built in today. Okay. Yep. Um, so the biggest questions I have for this corn market today is first, let's start with the farmer and the commercial has the leverage now. Okay. It's in the bin, it's put away. How much are you willing to pay to get it out of there? Right. But in the same token, what are going to be the cash flow needs here in January, right? Mm-hmm. Will we see the farmer move corn for cash flow needs? Will we see the commercial move corn, free up space and, and cash flow needs as yeah. well, right? Good so, point. you know, this 430 area personally, I've seen as an area where guys are willing to, you know, price basis contracts. I think guys are very hesitant to roll basis contracts after what we saw last year. Okay. which, you know, unfortunately might be the reason to do it this year, right? But, um, <laughs> yep. you know, I think we're at levels that guys are comfortable with. We've seen this fourth area be a firm area of resistance mm-hmm. for December corn, and and I've seen it personally here as, as an area guys are willing willing to step in and make some moves. The, the next question I have is, have buyers learned their lesson, right? Buyers that, you know, thought this crop was just going to fall into their lap got burned, and, um, you know, are they, you know, are they going to flip a 180 there and are they getting aggressive today? I am starting to hear some coverage here, um, you know, under the D-scan time frame. Um, but are they going to play it close to the chest thinking maybe the farmer does move corn for cash flow needs, you know, it's hard to say today. Um, but you know, those, those are the two big questions I have as far as where this cash market heads in the East. So what, what's going to do the work is basis or is futures. Okay. What's going to do the work here to move the corn where it needs to be, to pull it out of the bins, to pull it out of the commercial, what's going to do the work. So I think futures will be a little bit more choppy down the road here. Once Trump does take office, let's, let's be honest. We saw it for four years, right? Um, The spreads are doing work today to move it out of the commercials hands. Basis is doing that work today for corn. Um, so for me, if you're looking at this corn market and how to market, um, I think you could be friendly basis and conscious of futures, we'll call it right. Okay. Um, I think, you know, if if you see some good basis opportunities, you do look to lock those in and play the future side a little bit later. Um, that's kind of how I view marketing this this corn crop as well as okay. paying attention to spreads too right is it worth carrying are you doing that math gotcha so that's gotcha. kind of my overall highlight you know for the for the corn balance sheet um where i think the usda is is a bit off yet okay um and where so I that's think we not have the that go. that's not a big time bearish story obviously that you're telling in corn here what about soybeans is is it a similar story or how do you see it the soybean balance sheet to me, um, you know, I like the move that the USDA made on yield. I think that was the right move. How much more do they have to go um, from what I've seen in the East? Maybe a bit more, but, you know, I still look at, yeah, it seemed like a drastic drop, right, in our overall production. Um, but that still leaves, you know, current soybean stocks to use ratio, pretty healthy levels, you know, 11% area. Um, so 
pretty healthy numbers there on the beans. Now, I, I don't really argue right now with it where I think the USD is on the soybean balance sheet. I'm pretty okay. comfortable with most of that. There again, you know, what's going to be the U.S. biofuel subsidy policies when Trump takes office? You know, I mean, we've seen soybean crush get hammered since election day. Um, fresh margins, you know, are taking a beating. Soy oil has been getting sold aggressively because of concerns of the Trump administration. Um, so there's some big var- variables there, but mm-hmm. that's where, to me, you know, the yes, China's, you know, you, you heard the sales this morning. Um, you know, once this export market shuts off for beans, and I don't think we're that terribly far away, especially when you look at where South America uh, is headed right now for a good crop, 80% planted. Weather looks favorable. You know, China's going to try to hold out for for South American beans, right? So to me, unfortunately, yes, futures are priced off delivery values, you know, um, the export market. I know we don't all love that at times. It's where I look at this market and say, uh, futures concern me. We saw a little bit of that today. Um, but basis, I, I think, could get very hot domestically with the processor. I think the processor is going to have a hard time. That's the cues I've been getting from the processor here. They're trying to get everything bought up now because I think they are concerned about pulling those beans you know, out further down the road. Futures not doing the work basis is right. going to have to do the work. Um, so for me, I, I, I'm, you know, a little bit different on the bean scenario, right? Again, the farmer has leverage here. Question is what's going to do the work basis or futures. And when I just kind of look at our, our, our current, you know, supply and, and I look at our stocks use there and what Brazil is expected to produce. Um, I, I think, Pressure in futures is where I lean, um, but I do think some strength and basis could be yeah. very big down the road. Yeah, yeah. I, I could hear you setting up for that kind of a scenario as you were talking about the balance sheet on on beans. A little pressure on futures, but strength and basis to get some some volume to move out there. Man, right. Man, you do a great job in these conversations, Craig. Oh, you're you, too you, kind, Chip. I yeah, appreciate but you that, just give it, you, you give us all something to think about and a little bit of a different way of looking at some of these things sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's valuable stuff, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on again, Chip. You bet. Craig Van Dyke. Uh, wow. Keystone Cooperative out, out of Valparaiso. Excuse me. Out of Valparaiso, Indiana. Jeez, Davis and I'll be right back. If the world is your oyster, we've got pearls of wisdom on Agritalk. Welcome back to Agritalk, everyone. So glad that you joined us this afternoon. Your pal Davis Michelson here along with Chip Flory, your beloved yeah. benevolent host. Glad to have you here with us as well, buddy boy. Hey. Yep. Yeah. Maybe I forgot to take my pills this morning. Maybe I'm a little off. Well, but none of us like that. Like it when that happens. It seems like, and this would be pre-COVID, so more than like a couple years ago, I guess we're getting to now. Where yeah. wasn't there a whole big discussion about farmers building on farm storage? Wasn't that a whole big thing for about a summer? Oh yeah. Are you recalling that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um. And it was it it was definitely pre-COVID, mm-hmm. but it happened again in the fall of 2020 and spring of 21 because there was there there was so much grain bin damage from the derecho in August of 2020 that when they came to to replace. Yeah. It wasn't just replace; it was expansion. Yeah. So now the the construction has slowed down. It, it, come on, sure, it, sure. It, it it absolutely has. But yes, I no. The, when you look at 
uh, storage space available on farm right yes. now compared to 10 years ago? Oh, Dave, mm-hmm. uh, it, there's been a significant increase. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Craig Van Dyke, a uh, great conversation, Keystone Cooperative there, was kind of talking about that rub. Um, will the commercials have to uh, entice those bin doors open or if they wait a little bit will farmers voluntarily open up those bin doors because they they've got some cash flow needs that they've got to handle there um i'm rolling that around in my head i I find it fascinating and i think part of it goes back to the l word leverage how much leverage does that farmer have how much leverage does the does the commercial have um very interesting Right, right. The cash flow needs was one of the notes that I made in the conversation as well. It is different than what it was a year ago, because a year ago we were anticipating a a significant tightening in net cash farm income, Mm -hmm. Uh, but we were just anticipating it. We were coming off a, a couple of pretty good years, and cash flow was really a uh, working capital was really in pretty good shape this time a year ago. It w- wasn't as good as it was the you know a year before that, but um, it was m- better than what it is today. Now, as we get into January and the cash flow needs do increase, does that is it is that a big enough of a factor that it will change up how grain moved? year on year i think it's a great point uh one that that we need to think about and ask about more he also uh brought up stocks to use and i wrote down here he's he seems to think stocks to use is at least moving in the right direction currently i got that right on corn yes on corn Mm -hmm. yep and uh you know for me yeah i shouldn't say for me i think you know People look at 12% stocks to use ratio on corn is yeah. kind of that dividing line. If you're bigger than 12%, it's really, there's not a lot of incentive to move prices higher. If you're below 12%, okay, things are starting to tighten up a bit. Uh, pay attention uh, to to any uh, supply side scares because that there's there's not much of a supply side cushion. So. The, to me, the comment that I picked up from Craig there was, as, as you said, as you said, the situation is going the right direction in corn, and um, pay attention to any supply side scares that might happen, whether it's in South America or or in uh, the U.S. in in the year ahead. Now on beans, we can absorb some lost bushels. That's kind of the bottom line there because our our stocks to use ratio is is high enough that it, uh, it well I said it we can absorb some lost bushels without doing a whole lot to the price outlook. The moisture content of both the corn and soybeans crop uh, crops keeps coming up here. Um, I guess I I don't know enough about that to confidently feel like I know. The, all of the implications there, but it certainly is on the minds of our guests, isn't it? I th- I think it had something to do with that 1.4 bushel per acre drop in the national average bean yield mm-hmm. that we got from USDA October to November, and yeah. that would have been reflected in the on the farmer survey. Mm-hmm. I, the, it's I don't want to overcomplicate this. No, okay, I I, I don't want to do it. Um, I, I just want to say that moisture is water. Water is weight. You sell grain based on weight, not on how much volume it's filling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay? How much space it's, it's taking up. So if you've got, if you're producing, uh, boy, I don't want to complicate it. I, I, no. I No, you're doing great. And, no, because if I do, I'm going to get in way over my head on this one, and I don't want to do that. I right. don't want to do that. Yeah. Right, right. Um, well, and it's you know, it's it's almost an irony the uh, the solid yields that we've gotten, and yet if it comes in so dry, 
Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, that's can help mm-hmm. to perhaps mitigate some of those snowballing stocks, Chip. Maybe we'll find out in quarterly grain stocks reports in the future. Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. This is seriously um, an awesome learning experience because Mm -hmm. we've never taken a crop out of the field, corn and soybeans, as uniformly dry as Mm -hmm. the 2024 crops were. Yeah. And so, like I said, it's a learning experience and or learning opportunity for all of us. So yeah. we'll figure it yeah. out as time goes on. National Weather Service 610 day outlook November 27th through December 1st. December 1st. Below, yeah, below normal temperatures across the entire most of the country. Above normal precipitation over the entire Corn Belt. 8 to 14 day November 29th. Oh, D5 more of the same coming our way wow. on taps.